And everything you see is provisional. Two things happen. To some people, they have immediate what we could only metaphorically call the dark night of the soul. They go into a deep depression because everything they thought was real is no longer real, including their own name, form, body, and mind. Some people get so scared that they have a bad trip. Some people cross that threshold and discover nirvana or <laughs> enlightenment. And they say, wow, I thought I was, I was squeezed into the volume of a body in the span of a lifetime, but I'm a timeless being that can morph myself into any experience, including the human experience, which is amazing. But the human experience is also that which causes existential depression. So the causes of human suffering, since you brought it up, are brought up in Eastern wisdom traditions as, number one, you suffer because you don't know who you are. You confuse yourself with your body-mind experience. Number two, you grasp and cling at experiences which are evanescent and transitory and dreamlike. You say, what happened to your childhood? It's over. What happened to yesterday? It's over. What happened to five minutes ago? It's over. What happens to these words? By the time you hear them, they don't exist. So, you know, Wittgenstein, the German philosopher said, we are asleep. Our life is a dream. But once in a while, we wake up enough to know that we are dreaming. So what do you wake up to? When you cross this threshold, you wake up to your true self, which uh, is not body or mind, but the awareness in which that experience is happening. So grasping and clinging at a dream is the second cause of human suffering. The third is uh, being afraid of anything that's unpleasant, pain, abandonment, being treated by someone uh, not respectfully. So that's, you know, there's aversion to certain experiences. Third cause of suffering. Fourth is identifying, which is related to it, with your ego identity. And fifth is the fear of death. Now they're all connected. They're all the same fear and they are not knowing who you are. This is the biggest question everybody should be asking. Who am I? What am I? Am I the changing experience of this body, which is a perceptual activity? Am I the experience of the changing mind or the changing personality? Because you don't have the same personality when you were a kid or maybe even 10 years ago. What is it at the basis of this? When you start that reflective self-inquiry, Ask yourself, who am I? What do I want? What is my purpose? What am I grateful for? Go into the stillness of meditation. You have what wisdom traditions have called revelation, revealed truth. Now, you know, that sounds very grand. I would say just call it insight. You know, meditation, mindfulness, uh, awareness of body, awareness of mind, awareness of mental space, awareness of the web of relationship, awareness with that which we call the universe it leads you ultimately to the awareness of awareness. And when you discover that, that's nirvana. Now, everyday experience is modified consciousness. So right now what you're experiencing is what we call the waking state of consciousness. So awareness is modifying itself every time you open your eyes into this experience, right? And you call it the physical world. Now, if you close your eyes, you have another state of consciousness where you don't actually experience the physical world. You experience sensations, images, thoughts, emotions, stories. It's like a dream. As soon as you close your eyes, you're experiencing, you might call it daydreaming, but there's no difference between a daydream and what you dream at night. The physical world has disappeared, there's only a mental world. Then you go deeper at night, even the mental world disappears in what we call deep, deep sleep. Now that is the highest intelligence, by the way, because in deep sleep, there's unconscious processing going on, there's creativity going on, there are correlations being made, there are toxins being removed, there's a whole resetting of your uh, memories and consolidation of that. So in deep sleep, even though there is no experience of a physical or a mental world, it's a very intelligent, highly, highly correlated state in which unconscious processing is occurring. Memories are being consolidated. Imagination is being refined, etc. even though you have no conscious experience. So think of these three states metaphorically, like you would think of water becoming ice as the physical world, water as water, fluid, dreamy, 
water as vapor, even more dreamy and fluctuating and ambiguous and contradictory and difficult to grasp. But if you want a little bit beyond that, I'm speaking metaphorically, you'd end up with what is called the quantum vacuum, which is the fundamental ground of existence according to science. But you can do that subjectively. You can move from the physical world to the dream world, to the sleep world, and beyond to what is called fundamental consciousness, which is the source of all knowing, all experience. In wisdom traditions, it's called undifferentiated consciousness. So what is reality? What we call reality, what today science calls reality, comes under the heading of naive realism. Einstein was a naive realist. And I'm not saying this in a derogatory fashion. It's, it's, it's a word in the science of philosophy. Naive realism means that the physical world exists exactly as perceived by the five human senses. Now, obviously, that's not true. Other species experience the world through different modes of sensory perception. The second aspect of naive realism is that the physical world, as perceived by the five human senses, would exist even if no one was observing it. Well, how do you prove that? And firstly, it's naive because we know that the world is more than what is perceived by the five human senses. So this leads us to a solution actually of the hard problem of consciousness, which is get rid of the idea that the world is physical. What we call of the world as physical, even your physical body is a perceptual activity consciousness, not through mosquito consciousness, not through plant consciousness. But non-dualism says, go beyond that. There is only one consciousness that is differentiating, you know, undifferentiated consciousness, differentiating into these different species of consciousness that form a matrix of conscious beings that are collectively projecting this universe. I don't think consciousness being formless and infinite is subject to either birth or death. This is a vacation we are having on planet Earth right now, and so might as well enjoy it. But death is not the end of consciousness, it's the end of a certain storyline in consciousness, a certain interpretation of perceptions, images, feelings, and thoughts. It's not that I don't think about death. I ask myself, what is beyond my provisional identity and I dwell in that, and that has a very interesting outcome, which is the outcome in every spiritual tradition. There are only three things that happen, by the way, in a religious or traditional experience. One is transcendence. You know that you are not an entity in space and time, that your true self is formless, infinite, unbounded, borderless, unfettered, free consciousness, number one. Number two, you have the emergence of what usually are referred to as platonic truths. Goodness, beauty, harmony, love, compassion, joy, equanimity. And number three, loss of the fear of death. There's nothing more important than having those three experiences. And they've been part of every wisdom tradition for thousands of years. Love is not a sentiment. Love is not an emotion. Love is the ultimate truth at the heart of creation which is unity consciousness. One consciousness differentiating into infinite modes of experience, infinite knowers, infinite modes of knowing, infinite phenomena known, all generated within the one self. Just like when you were just a fertilized ovum, you were one stem cell, stem cell, pluripotential cell. It became eyes, it became nose, it became fingernails, it became heart, it became brain. So that one cell differentiated into all these different cells, each with its own modality of experience. Like that, the one mind or the one consciousness differentiates itself into what we call the universe with every species of consciousness knowing the universe in its own unique way.